Yes. And now for the last talk of this session, we have Professor Justin Ferrone, a professor of physics at California State University, San Marcos. And before um, starting his position at CSU San Marcos, he worked at NIST. You can see a theme here. So here's one of our pipelines. Um, and I look forward to hearing your viewpoint on options for incorporating specialized quantum training into existing programs or for novel programs. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so th thank you for having me. Uh, as you said, my name is Justin Perron. I'm at Cal State San Marcos. We're a uh, predominantly undergraduate and minority serving institution in North County, San Diego. And I'm going to talk about the challenges and, and approaches you can get to in implementing quantum information science education at an institute like ours, the challenges uh, that, you're, that come up and, and things like that. I don't think uh, I have to spend much time sort of motivating this, right? I think we're all sort of convinced that quantum information science is gonna be a, a huge element of the future economy in that. Um, arguing why we need that at the bachelor's level, um, I think you just have to look at the current workforce landscape. Uh, this paper was posted a month or two ago to the archive that went through just the, the degree requirements for job postings in quantum education or in, in quantum industry. And right now with the field being so young, it is sort of top heavy. They need a lot of PhD trained researchers with a deep fundamental understanding to sort of show the value and develop new devices and, and bring these texts to market and that. But already, you know, in North America, a third of the postings require only a bachelor's level education. So I think the more we can sort of implement this sort of quantum aspects into our curriculum, the better. This is echoed in some analysis of industry surveys and, and questionnaires. Where, where industry stakeholders have said, you know, we need uh, traditionally trained scientists and engineers with uh, quantum awareness, right? So we wanna sort of provide that quantum awareness in our programs already and give our students an opportunity to thrive um, in, in this growing marketplace. And as it reaches more and more maturity, there's gonna be more and more jobs with that at that sort of level where, where we just need, you know, an RF engineer whose who's main task is, is getting those signals down through their Christ out on the chip. That's a classical engineering task, but you know, it helps if you know what a qubit is and where it's going and how your stuff is affecting the larger tech. So we want to bring that to the undergrad level. Where is it happening now? Um, 300 in study looking at over 300 institutions and, and which, which institutions had courses relating to quantum information science. Um, only 74 did. And something I find kind of telling is, you know, almost 90% of them are doctoral granting institutions. Kind of makes sense. These are the big sort of elite R1 institutions that have a lot of faculty with expertise in QIS. They're gonna be infusing their curriculum with it. That's where these are naturally gonna grow out of, but it highlights some problems that can start to park up. One being, when the economy reached maturity, and I, I don't think there's a capacity to meet the need of that economy, uh, economy if we're going just through those institutions, but also um, access issues. You know, if, if you're if feeding a workforce through 10 institutions, um, you are baking into that workforce any representation issues and that that are at those institutions. So as um, Professor Temple pointed out, um, we have an opportunity to sort of fix that as the community is being built and, and bring this sort of curriculum and the opportunities to some of these other types of institutions and get a more, a better representative workforce at, from the ground floor rather than trying to fix, fix um, some of these representation issues that, that plague the STEM fields. So for me, the question is more, how can we do this at, at a place like mine? When I, when I started here, I wanted to, you know, to introduce my students to the field, give them those opportunities. I realized I was the only faculty member in my department and I was one of two on the entire campus that had any experience relating to quantum information science. So it was a challenge. I didn't know what the best way to do any of this. So uh, I tried to establish a brain trust, make some friends, meet some people in network. We ended up hosting the Quantum Undergraduate Education and Scientific Training Workshop uh, funded through APS's Innovation Fund. And we posted a summary to the archive. Um, basically, we had 90 or so faculty from predominantly undergraduate institutions. Uh, we had panels from industry expressing the needs that they anticipated, uh, academic experts from some of those R1s who, who had developed these programs that uh, to sort of give us a lay of the land. And then just a lot of breakout sessions trying to identify challenges that we face at our types of institutions and develop strategies for overcoming them. Um, 
we identified more problems than a math book, as they say, everything from sort of how do I choose my learning outcomes, right? Like I, I know I have my Dill fridge in my lab. I work on silicon quantum electronics. I know what I'd like my students to know. It's not necessarily what the workforce is going to need in general. So, so what do I choose what they are, should be learning in, in this program, all the way up to some things that have been mentioned earlier, um, interdepartmental college, uh, politics, right? We had faculty who were like, there's a college of engineering and a college of science this interdisciplinary course I'm trying to develop, which one does it get offered in, right? Like budgets are set on where students are taking their classes. So that can lead to some contentious discussions between people and sort of building that interdisciplinary program is a big challenge at such certain, especially places with like several resource restrictions. So, so we looked at that, we figured one thing that became clear, it's going to be institution specific, depending on where you are, but we were able to sort of break down our discussions into a certain themes that, that we kind of summarize in that, in that summary. Today, I think what I'm going to focus on is, is the programmatic approaches, you know, the, the sort of path of least resistance and best way, I think, to get this successfully into your, your um, undergraduate program and, and where you can start to put this content and design your curriculum so, so you're building those quantum aware graduates that can thrive in this economy. Um, the programmatic approaches, it seems kind of obvious <laughs> looking back at it, but um, baby steps and, and build on your successes. Take the small, easy steps first uh, uh, to build your case. The easiest thing is, is add modules to existing courses, right? You teach a quantum mechanics course, you have the academic freedom to take a week and do a module on some quantum uh, information science concept that gives some students some initial exposure. That's great. Um, it's also a really useful first step to building some of that administrative support that people have mentioned. You know, I can take course evaluations where students are talking about that module that they really liked, bring it to administration with some of those uh, industry numbers I showed earlier and make a strong case that even though it hasn't hit quite yet, this is something we should be doing for our students and giving them those opportunities. And that can sort of gain support and, and your convince your administration to help you in your efforts. Um, that leads to what I think is probably the most impactful thing that can be done at institutions like ours is have a quantum information science introductory course at the lower division on the books. Um, this broader coverage of the field and gets, you know, that, that foundational sort of quantum awareness that the students, uh, that employers are really looking for. And it's formally documented on the transcript so the students can communicate that experience in a clear way to potential employers, making them, you know, more marketable when they reach there. Um, uh, you can, again, then take those successes and use it to build a case for an even larger sort of program. If you have the, depending on your institution, which courses are offered in that, where you can, um, you know, maybe a minor or a certificate program and that. And basically, like I said, start small and use your successes to gain more support, build teams, you know, find people in other departments who, to sort of join the effort and, and get bigger as you, as you go and build that capacity. Uh, another thing that is, can be really useful for people at institutions like mine is um, summer institutes. You can sort of pool resources with institutes in your area, you know, faculty expertise, run a summer school for students, give them that exposure. They can have a certificate of a completion, say, to again, communicate that uh, those experiences to potential employers. You can also develop tools that you use at those um, summer schools and bring them back and implement them in your course as well. And again, you can use the success to show interest and need for to help convince your deans to support you in your efforts to get those courses offered. Um, so that's kind of, I think, uh, in hindsight, the obvious uh, a way to go through it what do we want to put in our curriculum? So our discussions we, at, at the workshop, kind of, we split them into lower division and upper division content. At the lower division, as I said, I think, and, and this was sort of echoed uh, by a lot of the panelists in that, that, that an introductory course accessible to a broad range of students is probably the best thing that you can do to get that quantum awareness. And, and a lot of people I know have already mentioned this, but um, the, the prerequisite alignment so that CS majors, engineers, mathematicians, physicists can all get into that course is a bit of a challenge. But um, 
I think uh, the, the paper that Thomas mentioned earlier, that quantum engineering uh, undergraduate roadmap is an excellent resource for that. They actually have some case studies of, of, of different institutions that have programs developed and, you know, sort of which topics they included in their path and that. So that's really useful, but it, it can be done. Uh, there's a growing list of resources and textbooks uh, aimed at that. Our discussions led to some example student learning outcomes that you can put in a course like that, that we think requires nothing more than college level algebra as the prerequisite and teaching like linear algebra and the other math in that course as necessary. And that would cover, you know, formally describing superposition, entanglement, multiple qubit states, um, the matrix operations for gates and that, um, you know, a lot of things that broad introduction to the field uh, and again would be documented on transcripts um, and and early in the academic career is I think important at the sophomore level so students can make minor adjustments to their program later on to build in even more quantum awareness say an electrical engineer perhaps takes this course and after seeing what the field's about and being introduced, they still have time in their senior year to you know, switch an elective to maybe quantum mechanics or something else to, to add to that. Um, one of the quotes from the panelists, and I, I wish I remember who exactly said it, was you can't have a quantum information science program if you don't introduce quantum information science till the senior year, right? And that's already sort of been uh, alluded to here. So we, we wanna sort of get the content to them early and, and, and allow it to expand that quantum awareness as they see fit beyond that. Um, at the upper division, more courses are great, but again, very institutional specific. You know, if you have someone with expertise in quantum sensing, try to build a course on that. But uh, in terms of our discussion and, and make it, making them broadly applicable, we focused on modules for existing courses. Um, this obvious course where you can fit quantum information science concepts in is a, a quantum mechanics class. And there are a lot of topics that we identified as appropriate for that. And we, we found the prerequisites you probably wanted to cover before that. Any, either way you do it though, if you're gonna wanna take a two level systems first approach to your quantum mechanics class, um, rather than the Griffith style traditional, solve the differential equation, here's your stationary state wave function. That's well and good, but that's physics. If you start with say a stern gerlach approach and the two level systems, you can really quickly get through the core physics that you would need to do these concepts. I, I teach our quantum mechanics track here and we use McIntyre's text. It's a spins first approach. And by the end of the third chapter, we've covered superposition, measurement, the stern gerlach experiment and all those things. And, and I, I'm able to, six weeks in, we, I, I run a module on uh, quantum key distribution. We do the, I actually have an activity where, where students are exchanging qubits to other groups and you know establishing keys and checking to see if they've been eavesdropped in that. And again, I've had positive feedback from those on evaluations of that, that I'm not like using to, to get formal approval for, for more quantum information courses and things in our, in our curriculum. Um, other upper division courses, obviously uh, one place is advanced lab. Again, this has been mentioned by a lot of people already. Uh, Hands-on experience, really sought after by, by industry. You know, they, they love when people have hands-on experience with the topics beyond just the textbook theory stuff. Um, but that is a huge challenge. I don't know of anywhere that can afford some dill fridges for an instructional lab that you can run those things. But I was really amazed at all the resources available for things like quantum optics experiments and that, that can be done on the cheap, right? I have a student, having learned about them at the workshop, I, I have a student currently right now who's building one of these single photon experiments that can measure single photon interference and, and violations of Bell's inequality. And we're doing it, our budget has, has is stayed under $15,000, which, you know, isn't free, but considering when he's done <laughs> building this thing, we're going to be able to use that in our advanced lab as one of our optional experiments for years to come. There, that's a lot of impact for that 15 grand. And I think a lot of departments can sort of manage that investment if, if that's the case. Um, there's also NMR experiments where you can look at spin precession and, and, and learn about those things. And a, a big thing that's available now are these sort of virtual cloud uh, uh, computational labs, which I think, um, well, they're free and very useful. The UT Austin developed this virtual quantum optics laboratory. Um, uh, I think the professor from Santa Barbara mentioned they have modules as well, but um, they, they've shared resources that are that are really useful to run those sorts of things. And uh, IBM's quantum experience and other cloud quantum computing platforms 
are great ways where you can have, you know, computational labs where students can run, you know, quantum protocols on either quantum simulators or actual physical hardware through the cloud, um, which is a really great experience for them, but also um, can open the door to really engaging discussions of, you know, look at the performance on the simulator, how it's supposed to work with actual physical uh, qubits, and you can see how noise is starting to come in and creep in and have a discussion about where the state of the art of the, these devices are now and challenges currently facing the field. So a lot of great things can be done, I think, in, in on the lab side of things. We also, you know, participants were able to identify multiple courses that several universities already have on the books where you can sort of sprinkle these quantum information science topics and build in some more of that quantum um, awareness that industry is looking for. Obviously, you know, I'm not a mathematician or computer scientist, so I can't go into that, but they are summarized on that archive sort of paper uh, that we've posted. Um, and uh, yeah, so there, that's, I think, my view on, on, on the, the quickest, most efficient and effective way to get this to the undergraduate curriculum. I don't know how much time I have, but I want to spend a minute on where I think more support is, is needed and can really have an impact for this. We, we, you know, we've done some assessment of, of faculty with faculty who attended the workshop and that. One of the biggest things, and I think it's been echoed in some of the questions and discussions I've seen already, resources. You know, how, where, where can I find things to use in my classroom? You know, lecture videos and notes are great, but I think um, in-class activities, effective uh, modern pedagogical things you can do in your classroom are needed and can really help with that. Um, Discipline-based education researchers, I think, have a chance for really huge impact here to actually look at, are the students learning what we think they're learning and want them to learn? You know, see that we're doing things effectively. But um, as has been mentioned, a lot of people are sort of doing these siloed at their institution, reinventing the wheel all the time. Um, and that's a lot of intellectual sort of equity <laughs> that if we can find ways to share and, and a, an efficient way to get that to each other and as a community, get this into the hands of the students in an effective way. I think there's a huge need and a lot of impact can be had there. Um, a lot of other faculty, and again, it, it's been mentioned today, uh, would like some professional development opportunities. There is a ton of sort of quantum adjacent faculty. You know, my research is, relates enough to quantum information science that I can see the value and the importance of getting students exposure to this, but I'm not as well versed in the field enough to feel like I can, I can design and run that introductory course, say, uh, a week or two intensive workshop to help faculty sort of upskill a bit and give them the, the, um, the, the expertise that they feel comfortable to run those courses, I think would really help get this material into to more of these institutions. And on the other end of it, uh, I know there are a lot of uh, experts in quantum information science coming out of postdocs, starting faculty positions and that, that have little to no experience with effective practices that are shown to, to lead to better student success across all demographics, um, some professional development to help them uh, transmit their, their expertise and this knowledge in, in, a, in the most effective way, I think, would also be useful. Finally, uh, things of support, obviously, you know, uh, we've heard of, you know, how am I supposed to do this? with you know, three, uh, three, three course load and my research and all that, and then build new things. That's a big ask. Anytime uh, we can get convinced admin to support with time and money is useful. But I think one of the bigger things is, is community support, right? I, I know personally, and I've heard from a lot of faculty, one of the big concerns is I'm on my own here, right? I have, I have two colleagues that I can discuss this stuff with and, and with uh, assessment of our workshop and that, we found that a lot of people seem to be concerned with this. Uh, do you agree with statement like, statements like, I'm on my own when it comes to troubleshooting challenges relating to teaching uh, quantum information science and technology? A lot of agreement with statements like that prior to the workshop. Something as simple as a two-day workshop like this, where you met faculty and like-minded individuals trying to do the same sort of things, seemed to help with that. You know, We met people we could reach out with and ask for advice. Since then, we've been running these faculty online learning communities with, with people who participated in the workshop. We have, I think, 16 faculty members who, who meet every other week, and they just sort of brain trust, troubleshoot their efforts to start running their courses, and how can I get this concept in? And, and we've seen a lot of really good things from that. Just having that sort of structured community support to assist in, in what you're trying to do at your institution seems to be really impactful. And I think, you know, 
building more of that uh, it would would be really really useful. So um, I don't know how long it took, but hopefully I didn't go too long. Uh, I want to thank obviously everyone who helped uh, run the workshop and the folks and the innovation fund. But hopefully there's questions and, and we can continue talking. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I think we appreciated kind of the, the detailed prescription that you had in, in a lot of your slides. So I think a, a lot of us will be interested in uh, being able to see those slides. Um, be so happy be to, to share to me. Uh, let's open up the session for questions. Well, there is one question in the chat. Um, there's been some conversation in the chat. Mike, would you like to ask that question? Sure. Uh, and I, I saw that uh, Meenakshi uh, responded. So, you know, we don't have to spend too much time on it. But just, um, Justin, when you were talking about, you know, the different levels of, uh, I guess, training or support or certification for students, you know, going from modules up to like concentrations or even full, you know, QIS degrees. I think it's, I, I've just been kind of curious, you know, the extent to which we're aware whether those sorts of certifications actually like improve job prospects for those students or career outcomes versus say, you know, getting a traditional physics PhD. Not, not, not from a place of like skepticism, but just like, you know, so that, because this is a new thing, right? Like are our company's going to even know what it means if a student has QISE PhD. Yeah. So, so that's um, a, a, a very good question. I think it's a little early to, to know whether this is helping students in the quantum economy. I think obviously, so I, you mentioned PhD a lot and I, I know some programs are offering uh, grad level degrees in quantum information science. Um, at the undergraduate level, uh, again, I don't have data and I don't think, I think it's too early to actually show that it's the case, but I think you can add, um, I guess the, the, my, my sort of short and quick answer is I don't think it hurts if you can add, you know, uh, a course here and a course there to an, a degree that we already know helps them get jobs that exist now that aren't in the quantum economy. If we add a bit of quantum awareness to that, it's not hurt. Like, I don't, I think you can do that in a way that doesn't subtract from the degree they're already getting, but I can't see it not enhancing their prospects in the quantum economy. Um, if that, that's sort of the short answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a it's something to keep an eye on, and uh, I think industry panelists um, have said they they want these this quantum awareness, and and one of the challenges I have with that is how can students communicate they have that, and without some sort of formal coursework or something they can point to a certificate, a, 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 a course experience or something, it's essentially their word on their own, which which works, but. Let's be honest, if a student's coming out of my program at a small school, Cal State San Marcos, that's not known, you know, nationally for, for, for much comes out of it versus, say, a student from Harvard at an undergraduate degree, whose word are they going to take? You know, <laughs> they, they, I think those sort of documented experiences can help a lot with that. Um, yeah. Unfortunately. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, for time's sake, let's move on to the next session, but let's thank uh, Professor Justin Perrone for his talk. Okay, so let's see if we can. So the next session involves a breakout session in which you will discuss obstacles and strengths of your institutions in participating in quantum research and education. Um, so all of you will be placed in breakout groups. Hopefully we can do this without too many technical difficulties. When I sent out the um, calendar invitation to the meeting, I also attached an Excel sheet that includes your room assignments. So if you can look at your room assignment for the Friday session two, and let me go ahead and open up breakout rooms. Please feel free to try to hop into your assigned room yourself. If you cannot, then if you stay in the main session, I can place you. So you should be able to see breakout rooms now.
and Serena. It's yes. So um, I'm just going to stick around until people get in the right room. Um, I didn't Sounds know, good. I didn't know if he still needed me to facilitate or what was going on with that. Oh, yes. Yeah. So let me see if what you are assigned. Because I think technically I'm in like room seven or something. But, you know, we had talked on text. So. I oh, know. okay. The last email is your assignment. So give me one second to check. I saw that. But I'm around. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's great. So uh, 